Thank you very much. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the session uh, titled "Training and the Use of New Data Sources and New Technologies." We have uh, great panelists today with us, and um, uh, I would like to introduce them briefly now. Um, first, uh, we'll have uh, Christoph Bantams uh, from from UN Statistical Institute for Asia and uh, Pacific in Japan. Uh, Christoph uh, joined this institute uh, uh, as a statistician uh, a lecturer in June 2020. Uh, before joining the Institute, uh, Christoph was a research engineer specialist in statistics and econometrics at the Toulouse School of Economics. He worked on data analysis and, and estimation of applied econometrics models in several research programs addressing environmental and fund economic issues. He has published a dozen research papers and has co-written a practical book in French on Stata software for Stata Press, which is pretty impressive. Uh, he was also a member of the organizing committee for several scientific conferences, uh, including uh, Use R. Uh, R is essential in our work every day, so this is also an interesting piece of uh, information. In 2019, he has, oh, he, he's done that in 2019. He has an extensive experience in teaching statistics, revenue management, and data visualization uh, in several at several universities, research institutions, and engineering schools in France, Italy, China, and India. Later on, we'll have Mrs. Uh, and I'm sorry, I will probably mispronounce that, uh, Jean Grand Kim. Uh, uh, she is the director of Statistics Training Institute. She was she she has joined uh, this in in 2000 and implemented training programs such as Introduction to Statistics project-based vital statistics, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, um, uh, she has been working to develop statistical capacity of uh, COSTAT. She worked at the University of Divisions of Sample Design uh, and Quality Management uh, in between 2014 to 2019. Also during her career, she got a chance uh, as a visiting scholar, scholar at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Mich Michigan. Uh, then we'll have David Johnson. David Johnson is Deputy Director at the Data Science Campus at the UK's Office for National Statistics, where he leads a range of data science capacity building programs for the national and international public sector. Uh, he has nearly 20 years experience in the US and the European tech sectors uh, before co-founding the campus in 2016. He was part of the leadership team that set up Google's European headquarters in Dublin before founding his own machine learning startup and running an EU F, uh, FP7 research program uh, on the user on artificial intelligence for improved mobile search. So this is a pretty, pretty impressive career and uh, we're very happy to have you, David, here. Then uh, we will have Kevi, Kerry Regan, who, who is a senior capability uh, program manager at the same data science campus in the U in the UK. Uh, she is a member of the UN task team on skills training capacity development. Kerry has over 20 years experience of working at the ONS in training capacity and has played an instrumental role in designing many of the analytical and data science training programs that are being developed uh, across ONS, the UK government and internationally. And uh, together with her, uh, we'll present Minika Novak. She's a head of an experimental research unit at our institution in Statistics Poland. She coordinates programs dedicated to data stewardship and implementation of big data and advanced data processing techniques in statistical production processes across the whole institution. Prior to joining Statistics Poland, in 2015, she pursued a diplomatic career, which is uh, surprising, fostering high-tech business uh, development and R&D cooperation between Poland and Israel. And she led numerous research capacity building and social projects for the academia and nonprofit sector. Uh, and uh, at last but not the least, uh, we'll have uh, Alex Measure, uh, who is an economist at the U.S. Bureau of the Labor Statistics and co-leader of the BLS Data Science Users Group. He work, uh, his work focuses on using machine learning and neural language processing techniques to automate difficult information processing tasks in government statistics, including text classification, information extraction, error detection, and record matching. 
together with him, we'll have two presenters from Statistics Poland, um, Mrs. Marta kruczek Chapel and Mrs. Krystyna Piątkowska. They are both specialists uh, at the data engineering uh, department in this uh, regional office, in the regional statistical office in Poznan, in Poland. Uh, and they are very much involved in the machine learning project uh, uh, led by the UNECE High Level Group for the Modernization of Official Statistics. And, uh, and we are very glad that we'll have them all uh, together presenting uh, at our panel session, at our session. Uh, so not to waste too much time, I'd like to now turn to the first presenter, who is Christoph Bontemps. Uh, please, Christoph, the, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank Dominic for chairing this session and Ralph Baker for the invitation. So uh, before going into the, the topic of teaching big data, I, I have a disclaimer to do. I'm brand new at the United Nation. I just joined the Institute Statistical Institute for Asia and the Pacific uh, in June. And so my apologies for everybody that is involved in training and that I'm not citing here. I'm, I'm not fully aware of what is going on there. And all the views here uh, express only myself and that are biased by 20 years of experience in the academics. So um, teaching with a question mark. Uh, why this question mark about teaching? So um, as you all know, there is a difference between teaching and training. Right? Uh, teaching is about uh, knowledge and uh, instruction. This is the kind of thing that we learn at school. And training is about developing abilities, skills through practice with instruction and supervision. Of course, when we do training, we have to do teaching before. And at the CIAP, we do both in most of our courses. But I wanted to put that on the table as an introduction here, that there could be teaching and training. Also, I titled my uh, presentation Teaching Big Data, but Big Data here is a shortcut for new data sources and big data. So it's in a, in a very broad sense. So why do we need to teach big data? Uh, with COVID-19, we have seen that NSO has uh, to adapt. NSO, in fact, had new needs. And in fact, I think they also had now new missions this mission uh, in, include uh, to provide decision-making data for governments for uh, responsible for data dissemination, for data-driven uh, um, policies for politicians and for journalists and for global audience, which is quite new, I think, at least with these constraints and timelines. So it Collecting big data is, is already an, an, an emerging uh, trend within the NSO, and we know that they can complement uh, official administrative data. And this is quite difficult to integrate, uh, by the way. But this collection of big data is necessary and critical when it comes to emergency decisions, such as decisions taken during COVID-19 or for disasters. So this new constraint and new timelines, but some NSO have the resources to handle this big data and access to that. So it's an opportunity, but there are also some challenges to that. And I will come back to that in a, in a minute. So I think it's really uh, important and hence this session here during this uh, conference. So how can we help? Well, there are already many courses at CIAP uh, that include GIS, uh, data scanner data, uh, web scrapping, text mining, and we use R or Python that are the new tools in data science that uh, uh, use these languages. We have a course on big data with uh, Costats since 2016. There is this course on innovation of, in use of new data sources and methodology for SDGs. 
uh, ICT innovation for modernizing official statistics, uh, data visualization with Paris 21, and a seminar on statistical capacity building for new data sources. And we expect to have many more resources on our LMS uh, right now, because right now we are only teaching and training online. There are also uh, many other resources online uh, at the United Nations, on the, on the Global Working Group uh, Marketplace, on the Global Platform, at the uh, SDG Learn, uh, also at the World Bank, with the Open Learning Campus, at Eurostat, at the FAO, everywhere. And there are MOOCs and platforms, tutorials, and online university. So there are re resources out there already. But I want to emphasize the fact that uh, uh, we, um, we, we will uh, focus and we should focus on some elements. So the first thing I have to say is that many of the courses, at least the courses we have at the CIAP, and many of the, the, the courses uh, in different organizations already include chunks of big data. For example, in the course of gender statistics, uh, my colleague, uh, has been introducing at some data analytic part, and within this data analytics, they use that satellite data to enrich the survey about women marriage in Bangladesh. And they use also some predictive tools to help enrich uh, the survey and the analyzer at all. In a system of environmental and economic accounting, also they use satellite uh, images and land recognition to enrich this accounting. In a statistical business register, for example, uh, there could be some web scrapping techniques so that you can gather information about firms, about m &E, or their structure, and a different firm uh, they, they, they own in different countries. Of course, in data visualization course, we need to uh, focus a little bit more on uh, maps, maybe, and also on big data visualization. And metadata, we need also some definition on how to put metadata, uh, big data metadata there. So there are chunks of big data everywhere, and this is a growing trend, I believe. So um, what should we focus on? And here, by we, I intend the community, not, not, not of course, just the setup. And it's a personal view. So I think uh, we should focus on new methods. We cannot afford uh, to have uh, uh, people using software, black boxes of programs, without a good understanding of the statistical foundation of these uh, programs of software. So I, I think for data integration, this is very difficult to integrate this sort of non-traditional data into official data. So we need to have uh, some new method and we need to train for that. Um, many of this, um, uh, of this uh, um, data needs also, or we are tempted to introduce some methods to enrich them or to analyze them using statistical learning, such as machine learning or artificial intelligence. Uh, for that, I think we need to teach and to increase the big data literacy so that people really know how they come from and what we can do or cannot do with that. Because the, big, the, the data generating process of this big data is most of the time unknown. So we have to be careful. It's very different. So I think we should introduce statistical learning in our training and should focus on that. Many of these sources of data also include spatial statistics or spatial or geocoded uh, variable there. So aggregating and disaggregating that in a spatial, uh, at a spatial level is also something that is quite tricky, and maybe we should focus on that. Uh, of course, I already said that, but uh, big data visualization to increase visual literacy should be something we should focus on. Uh, but we also need a practical training. And for the practical training, uh, we probably need before to be uh, fully aware of the, of, of the theoretical content of that. But I think that the data gathering, whether it is for using satellite data or web scrapping or mobile phone data, 
this process is complex and and we need to, to have some uh, practical training on that. And I will say a word a minute on how we should do this practical training. Um, I should focus also on the fact that these data need maybe some curation before being used uh, to detect some anomalies. There are a lot of concern, and we have seen that during uh, this conference and also on the uh, Committee of Statisti on Statistics last week, that many people in NSO wonder about the legal issues uh, about the use of this uh, big data. And so maybe we need some training on that. There are some things that are specific to, to countries or regions, but there may be some uh, common uh, techniques to anonymize the data that could be shared among NSO. There are also some ethical issues. We know that artificial intelligence is biased by definition by the training data. So we, we need also maybe to, um, to put some practical uh, elements on the training about these issues. Uh, in order to be able to uh, have a continuous process that is quite transparent, uh, we need also to build um, a statistical workflow that starts from data and goes to the report. Um, we know that there are some tools that help to do that, such as notebooks, like Jupyter notebooks, or Air Mark Markdown. This thing facilitates the integration of the process and the transparency. This also helps collaboration. And we have seen uh, during COVID-19 that many statisticians uh, had to work from home and, and maybe they didn't have the practice or the skills to use uh, GitHub, GitLab, cloud computing, remote access and sharing information together. Of course, it's, it's easier when you have uh, this statistical workflow and the good practical training on that. I also have two remarks about that. I'm, I'm focusing here on hardcore training, uh, technical training, but the soft skills are also important um, because during uh, the, I, I said that then they sort of new missions. Within this mission, uh, many statisticians face the fact that they have to do some contracts with some uh, firms, uh, private or firms. So I'm not focusing on soft skills, but I think they are very important. And how to disseminate, how to communicate is also very important. So how to teach now? Uh, of course, we have to teach online, and 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 this is. This is not new, but this will stay, and this is a really serious trend. We have to maybe uh, try with micro-learning, uh, short self-paced learning on specific topics. Okay. Uh, we can use social learning. Many NSO have provided a lot of information and have done a lot of experiments with their data. So this knowledge should be shared and fertilized among all the other um, NSO, and we should help in that. So we should help le doing learning by doing and engage learner into action. Uh, we should also try to do collaborate learning and with case studies, peer review, teamwork. And we should also try to innovate on that. And that will be my conclusion, I think. Um, there is right now a hackathon uh, using um, um, maritime data, AES uh, data right now. By using this uh, uh, contest, and also by using games as we used recently at the CIAP, we can innovate in learning, and that will be very interesting in the future uh, for the profit of all our colleagues statisticians. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christophe, uh, uh, for this presentation. It's, it's a very important point in uh, our you know, uh, panel. Uh, we'll discuss it later on. Uh, I think that now it's, it's a good time to uh, ask the second panelist to go with the presentation. Uh, uh, after that, uh, we'll of course have the discussion and uh, we'll have a chance to, to, uh, to ask the questions uh, for which I ask you to, to, to ask on the chat and, uh, and, and, and we'll further you know, uh, uh, discuss the, the issues uh, raised also in this presentation. But now I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. Sorry for mispronunciation again, Sean Grang. Kim for her presentation.
We are pleased to present on Big Data Training Courses in Statistics Training Institute of Korea at the United Nations Big Data Conference. This is Jonglan Kim and Jemin Na from Statistics Training Institute. I would like to present about Statistical Training Institute's Big Data Training and our future plans. These are the topics we are going to cover. In Korea, schools, research institutes, and government officials have different interests in big data. The current big data scientist training is shown in the following diagram. Data scientists need a systematically organized program covering all areas of statistics, mathematics, software, and hardware related to the subject. So, the systematically organized programs need to be covered in school education. However, it is difficult for only one training institute to train research institutes, statistical workers, and government officials who need knowledge and skills to deal with the latest big data. In the end, Training for knowledge and skills need collaboration and communication with each institution of each field. In Korea, it is considered that the core competences needed in the era of big data are foundation coverage, technology coverage, analysis coverage, and business coverage. Currently, Statistics Training Institute focuses on analytical skills and in some cases, it includes three different coverages. The important point is that in order to improve respective capabilities, case study should be included in the curriculum. The detailed explanation for each essential competences are here. Here's detailed explanation for foundation and technology competencies. Here's detailed explanation for analysis competency. Here's detailed explanation for business competency. In Korea, professional training institution for government officials exist for each ministry. For national government officials, there is National Human Resources Development Institute. For local government officials, there is Local Government Officers Development Institute. The Korea Institute of Health and Welfare Human Resources Development will improve the capacity for government officials who is working in health and welfare field. While these three institutes covers general topics regarding big data, such as foundation, technology, and businesses. Statistics Training Institute focuses on analysis of big data. Before the era of big data, statistics training had been only focused on the traditional statistical production, but as the data sources differs, the training programs are also covering big data part of data collection, storage, management, processing, and analysis. Previously, we had focused only on survey-based training programs. But now, we keep developing big data-based training programs. Now, these are the big data training programs we have developed so far. We have understanding big data and administrative data, statistics production using administrative data, and database policy making. Also, we have data analysis with Python. In this course, we cover Python data handling application, module utilization, data entry and type, and also case study on marine accident data provided by public data portal. Also, we have how to base big data 
statistical analysis, and in this course, we cover collecting, storing, processing, and analysis of structured and unstructured data, and working with actual data such as microdata, 2015 population census, small business data from Statistics Korea, or small businesses closure forecasting model, de model development. Even though we were confident with experience of this year's big data program, the outbreak of COVID-19 brought us new challenges. We came up with plan of 2021, considering challenges we are facing with the new training environment. The difficult part of big data training in the national statistics is that it is difficult to trust big data analysis quality. In particular, the methodology of big data defined by private sector is hard to identify unless it is disclosed. However, the UN Global Working Group provides handbooks on mobile phone data usage, which is very helpful in that each country can have standardized reference. In this regard, I would like to express my appreciation for those who made it available to apply the handbook as a training program in Korea. Through these handbooks, Statistical Training Institute is preparing to provide training by combining the handbook and Korea's, net as Korea's analysis cases. The most difficult part is the composition of instructors, data, and textbooks to provide as training. Private sector, university professors, and researchers and government officials are working together to make use of it in training. But still, it would be helpful if data, programs, and guidelines were shared in detail on how mobile data is distributed from base station. COVID-19 has brought both crisis and opportunity to Statistics Training Institute. As face-to-face -face trainings turn into non-face-to-face -face trainings, it has become most important in statistics analysis training, whether trainees or instructors have the ICT environment and needed software. Although free tools such as R, Python are possible, paid software such as SAS, SPSS, are not owned by trainees. And with that trouble, we came up with the idea of virtual desktop infrastructure. This allows remote access to the server and provides an environment where, where analysis tools can be used. COVID-19 has become an opportunity to try e-learning and online video training at home. We suffer for big data training and virtual desktop infrastructure system. Statistics Training Institute has all the infrastructure needed for non-face-to-face -face trainings. In old system, the available statistical packages vary depending on which computer lab you're in. Virtual desktop infrastructure made it possible to organize training regardless of place and software. With the infrastructure, online platform, and e-learning, we anticipate success of our big data training programs even under COVID-19. We will also service e-learning program in English for other countries. The English version of e-learning will be on basic statistics, sample theory, and statistical thinking. We would appreciate it if you could have a lot of interest on those programs. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, it was another impressive presentation. And uh, now we are quickly uh, uh, moving to uh, David, uh, who uh, will tell us about the ONS experiences and uh, 
uh, David, David, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. I'm David Johnson, and I'm a Deputy Director at the Data Science Campus at the UK's Office for National Statistics. The Data Science Campus is a data science research and development hub, not just for the Office for National Statistics, but also for broader UK government. We undertake short research projects that explore new data sources and new uses for existing data. We develop new methodologies for working with big data and assess their relevance both for official statistics and decision making. Today, I want to share some of our experiences of providing big data training in a post-COVID environment. From our launch four years ago, we wanted the campus to be a learning environment, both for our own staff, but also to act as a catalyst to increase the use of data science skills across ONS and government. As the needs of statisticians and other analysts and the departments they work in can vary greatly, we've developed a range of capacity building programs to meet those needs. Now, at first, we reached out to university partners to help meet these demands. We worked with three universities to develop an MSc in data analytics for government. This is a part-time program to provide government analysts with advanced statistics and machine learning skills. Analysts can undertake the course at the universities themselves or on site at ONS offices. We also worked with academic partners to deliver the UK's first apprenticeships in data analytics and data science, where we recruit high school graduates directly into the campus and through practical hands-on work and classroom-based learning, we train them to be junior analysts and data scientists. These programs were augmented by training provided by our data scientists themselves, many of whom came from an academic background. In 2018, the head of the civil service gave us the goal of training 500 government analysts in data science by 2021. We quickly realized that to meet this target, we needed to increase the level of training we delivered ourselves. And so we launched our own data science faculty at the campus with full-time data science lecturers. Now, we don't award our own degrees or other academic credits. Rather, our lecturers develop and deliver tailored learning programs to meet the operational needs of ONS and other government departments. These can cover a wide range of data science skills, from basic coding to advanced machine learning techniques. But we also believe that hands-on practical work is often the best way to embed newly developed skills. So we undertake collaborative practical projects and run mentoring programs. The largest of these is our National Accelerator Program, pairing government analysts with experienced data scientists to work on 12-week projects, both at the campus and at government hubs across the UK. How does this all fit together? Well, if we look at a four month period last year from April to July, our in-house team delivered over 240 hours of training to almost 300 analysts across ONS, UK government and international partners. Our university partners trained a further 60 or so people on site at ONS in week long sessions. Our mentoring program spans seven UK locations with over 20 projects being mentored and we delivered a range of workshops on demystifying AI to frontline civil servants at six national conferences across the UK. So what does this training look like? Well, here we have my colleague Jazz delivering a class on data ethics in our lecture theatre at the Data Science Campus. This photo was taken on March 5th of this year. This was also the last day that I was in the campus. Seven days later, I started three weeks of self-isolation with suspected COVID symptoms. While I was in self-isolation, the UK itself moved to lockdown and the office is actually only due to partially reopen later this month. In response to the pandemic, our data scientists were quickly tasked with providing rapid analysis for the Prime Minister's office, ONS and other key departments on areas such as the effectiveness of social distancing measures, the economic impact of the pandemic and much more. They worked with colleagues across ONS to identify alternative admin and big data sources for key ONS outputs where survey data was no longer reliably available. Now, this activity was mirrored across government where the need for big data and novel data sources had never been greater, along with analysts with the skills to use them. Now, obviously, during lockdown, on-site training was no longer an option. But as you will have seen, almost all of our training and mentoring programs relied heavily on in-person delivery. 
It was clear that we couldn't afford to pause our training programs until the pandemic had passed. We needed to transform all of our programs as rapidly as possible for delivery in the new normal. This presented its own set of challenges. The first was to convert all our course materials for delivery online. We decided to make what we thought were highest priority courses immediately available for anyone to download and take themselves, focusing on core coding skills and introductions to machine learning. So we needed to adapt all of these as self-directed text-based tutorials. And our first material was actually available within about two weeks on ONS learning platforms. We then focused on adapting our courses for lecturer facilitated delivery online. Now, the challenge with online delivery and the technology platforms and video conference tools used was that each government department actually uses its own platform like Skype or Microsoft Teams or Google Meet, etc., and blocks access to all the others. Access to industry standard learning platforms were also frequently blocked by corporate firewalls. No one size fits all solution would work, so we needed to be able to deliver in a platform agnostic way. Now, what this meant was that all material for our courses also needed to be available outside of Teams and Meets, etc. We decided to upload all our course material as packages to GitHub that students could download on their personal computer or laptop if necessary and run alongside whatever video platform had to be used with that department. Technology was also the biggest barrier to our mentoring programs. Our national accelerator program was two weeks in when lockdown happened. We gave participants the option of halting until after the lockdown or continuing, and actually over 80% of projects continued. Where a mentor and mentee were from different departments, they often couldn't work on the same platform. So common approaches like pair programming were challenging. Uh, in fact, the participants themselves developed workarounds, and this in effect gave us live A-B testing, where we could see the solutions that worked and quickly share those out to the rest of the program. Finally, we turn once again to our university partners. University of Glasgow was preparing to join our mDataGov framework and had already proposed delivering an entirely online MSc. They agreed to launch early, opening up the program three months early to deliver short courses catering to high demand skills. A second university partner also agreed to transform all of the week-long MSc courses they were due to deliver on site at ONS to online delivery. Now, the greatest challenge of all, of course, was the personal impact of the pandemic, both on our staff and the students themselves, as they all tried to work and learn at home, surrounded by family, unable to leave their homes and uncertain about the future. I am in awe of everyone who managed to find the right balance here and upskill themselves during this time. So how did this all work out? If you consider it took us four weeks before we were able to deliver our first online lecturer facilitated course. Over the course of the first four months of lockdown, we still managed to deliver over 120 hours of training to about 170 analysts. A further 30 people attended online courses from our university partners, some of which were still a week long. Our accelerator mentoring program finished with 20 projects completed, and we ran two virtual half-day mini-conferences, each with around 150 attendees. So overall, our lecturers have actually found the experience to be good. They say that online classes obviously have to be much more structured and there are less opportunities for going off on what they call chalk and talk tangents. They also had to adapt to new ways of ensuring student engagement and ensuring no one is left behind during the class. Luckily, our first classes understood that this was new for us and approached it with an attitude of co-creation, that they were helping us build a new learning framework for government. The real advantage of online delivery for us, though, was the ability to scale. For example, our virtual conferences have been attended by double the numbers that we could have accommodated in person. But more importantly, instead of being confined to our lecture theatres in Wales and London, we were able to work with departments across the UK and internationally, with training and mentoring programmes supporting colleagues in NSIs and partner governments from Kenya and Rwanda to Paraguay and Vanuatu. For some partners, we are actually able to provide greater support than we ever could have in person. And critically, the feedback from our students has been as positive as for in-person training. In fact, if we look now beyond the pandemic, we see online delivery and self-directed learning as being our primary focus, supported by in-person as the situation allows. We're now heavily investing in online learning resources. Now, it's something we would have done eventually anyway. This has just greatly accelerated our thinking. So what does the future look like? Well, 
we can't see a time in the near future where analysts from across the country travel to the campus to sit in a packed lecture theatre for a two-day course. We need to adapt not just to where we deliver our learnings, but the nature of those courses themselves. We need to become more user-centred, adapting our teaching methodologies to the new environments that our students find themselves in. One model that we love even before the pandemic is the bus rides program from the Digital Academy at the Canadian School of Public Service. They've produced a range of short courses in digital and data skills that students can take even on their mobile phone while commuting to work. Their idea is to build a digital first learning offering that is shaped around the student that can be fitted into whatever space they have available as they balance the many demands of their day job. And I think this learning approach has never been more timely as we all balance working from home, keeping our families safe and protecting our own mental health. And with that, I will leave you here with links to some of the resources I've mentioned earlier. Over the coming months, the campus will make all of its course material available online at the site for anyone to use. And we are happy to talk to any NSI that wants to use it and work with them to help them adapt it for themselves. The MDataGov online course from University of Glasgow is also open to international students and more information can be found here. The UN Global Platform is a fantastic resource. We will be uploading some of our course material there as well, and we strongly encourage other NSIs to share their own big data training material and case studies there. Finally, you can take a look at the Bus Rides program from our colleagues in Canada. It really is fantastic. Thank you all very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions later. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I hope everything goes all right and uh, we are all now online. But uh, as we planned before, we, we just thought about stopping here, making a little break and discussing the three presentations that we've had already, uh, which relate to the issue of uh, you know, you know, teaching and, and, and training. And uh, uh, there are a few questions already asked online. I, I think that the very interesting part of all the three presentation was uh, actually uh, stressing the fact that COVID-19 situation has its drawbacks and merits and then concentrating on the merits. I mean, uh, uh, finding uh, uh, the situation uh, uh, in a way that uh, uh, it is a, a not only a challenge, but also an opportunity to actually progress more quickly towards, uh, for example, online training and, and, and related issues. That's, uh, that's, that's something very promising and uh, we see it across statistical systems not only in, in, in the case of training but the training I think is the most important this is a a, a big opportunity for all of us to actually uh, um, you know uh, uh, develop these programs uh, very quickly during the pandemic so that we can be more prepared to what happens afterwards and, and with with our capacities much more increased and 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 and, and so on so uh, uh, I don't want to take too much time myself, but uh, I would like to give the voice to our audience. And of course, uh, there has been some questions already asked. I will try to uh, uh, keep the sequence. So I'll, I'll keep mentioning the, the first questions first. Uh, and of course, there were the questions uh, that we has been addressed to, to Christoph, Kim, and then at the end to you, David. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, uh, oh, well, let me, let me, Check that again. Uh, there was a question in terms of uh, this uh, Asian Pacific uh, Institute. Uh, uh, is is uh, uh, about the experts? You know, Bongo Choi asked, uh, "Is SIAP uh, is outsourcing experts on big data, or just using in-house lecturers?" That's that's a, I think very interesting question in order to to know how how this is uh, facilitated and in, in the institute uh, because it's easy to say that you, you train all the all, all the people uh, in a big data but how do you actually do that do you have to outsource yours uh, your trainers or do you do you have them on site? Uh, that, that's a very good question. Uh, the, the CIAP has a long uh, experience in collaboration with many experts and also uh, with uh, institutions. So uh, for the latest uh, courses, including some big data chunks, we had experts from World Bank, we have experts from uh, different uh, places there. And we, of course, will uh, um, collaborate even more uh, for this online training with 
because it's an, also an opportunity to have people which are really expert on a specific topic to join in an online program. So no, we're not, we are not doing, uh, not teaching and training with only our resource. We are a very small team, uh, but uh, we, we will collaborate and we will collaborate with NSO too, as mentioned that we should use and, and it was mentioned also by our partner, Costat. We have been partnering, uh, doing some partnership with Costat on this big data training. So uh, we will use an NSO experience also. They did some big data practical uh, in during this COVID-19. And we have seen many experience of that in the Stats Cafe, for example, uh, that, that, that were very good experience. So we should use these experiences and we should collaborate with NSO to um, capture this knowledge and, and pass that to other NSO that probably may have the same need and the same uh, type of data. So uh, we're not doing everything in-house. We collaborate with experts, with NSO, with institutions, to be sure. OK, Th thank you very much. And then there's another question to you, I guess. Uh, uh, um, Esperanza, uh, our dear friend from ITU, has asked whether you are you know, she, she argues that uh, what is missing in the, in the national statistical offices is uh, the capacity in terms of using Python, R, Tableau, and uh, does your institute uh, provide training on those to NSOs as well? Uh, yeah, the, within the courses, of, of course, we use some programs and, and we, we try to use most of the time uh, open source software such as R and Python. Uh, Tableau is, is, is really expensive and I think we can do much more with uh, uh, JavaScript or D3, which are also the tools for visualization. So uh, yes, there are some training on this software within our courses. There are not specific training on R or Python because you can find many of them uh, really for advanced user elsewhere. We, we train that for the specific purpose of each course. But yes, there are some training on R and Python within our big data courses. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And, and uh, the fact that you wrote, a, I have to, um, you know, let myself to make this point, you know, that you wrote a book in a startup press on using Stata is, is, is impressive. I, uh, for me, who spent most of my own life doing Stata coding, you know, this is, this is very impressive. So thank you very much for that, Anna. Uh, I would like to ask Kim now, because there's been uh, asked a question uh, uh, about how, how are you, I mean, uh, the, 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 the Bongo Cho, I mean, uh, Korea, uh, uh, how are you evaluating the outcomes of trainings uh, uh, and how otherwise training can satisfy lecturers or whether, you know, is it, what, what, what kind of a, a quality assessment do you have in, in place? Kim, are you with us? Yeah. So how are you uh, evaluating the outcomes of the trainings? Uh, the question that has been asked on the chat. Okay. Yeah. Also uh, for to measure the satisfaction level for the trainees, after online program, we had an evaluation for trainees, whether they are satisfied with the program. And the result was that their satisfaction were not that low compared with face-to-face -face training. So we think it's quite successful. Okay, the, 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 oh yeah. thank you very much for that, for the answer. And we have a question to uh, David, uh, actually two questions. Uh, does your training programs uh, uh, are available to uh, do your training programs? Uh, oh, I'm sorry for my English. Are your training programs available for for uh, for the outside audience? As I understand it, because the question actually points to that. Uh, yes, they are indeed. Um, we we very much want to work with uh, a wide range of NSIs and other statistical organizations to help their own uh, data transformation journeys. Um, our approach uh, traditionally has been, um, I suppose, what you could call a train-the-trainer methodology. 
okay? What we prefer to do is work with an NSI um, and be able to work with a core group of what we call champions, you know, people that want to become expert users in a particular data science or advanced statistical approach. And we work with them to train them directly up to a specific level and then hand all of our training material over to them so they can scale it out across their own organization. What we prefer to do is, is work in a collaboration in that way. So that way, with a small group of people, you can actually do both uh, direct training, but also collaborative projects and mentoring on work. Because as I said in the presentation, it's essential to use the skills in a live environment so that you embed that knowledge um, and that. And we find working with a small group of these champions that can then scale out the knowledge to the rest of their organization the most effective way. So we have programs uh, in, in place uh, with a number of partner NSOs ranging from sort of Stats Rwanda and Stats Ghana through to we've coll we're collaborating currently with Statistics Canada to roll out a training program in data science and machine learning across CARICOM countries in the Caribbean. So all of our material will be available to any NSO that wants to use it on the website that uh, I shared there. But we're very happy to partner with an NSO and help them customize that material and collaborate with them to help embed it in their own organization. Oh, thank you very much, David. I, I have to say that even though I'm, uh, well, maybe oh, not, not even though, but uh, I'm a chief statistician, I'm heading very often towards the uh, uh, you know, uh, web sources from uh, the ONS and the data science campus to, to learn myself, you know, so that I, I, would, encar I would encourage everyone to do that. Mm -hmm. They are very open and transparent and they're publishing a lot of very good stuff. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's for sure, but there's an avalanche of questions to you, David, on the on the chat. And the next one, which is pretty uh, interesting as well, and, uh, and it comes from Alexander, and I take this chance to say hello to Alexander. Uh, it's, it's good to see you here and then. Uh, you know, uh, uh, how does the ONS or Data Science Campus assess the training outcomes to ensure the courses fulfills the required uh, skills demanded by the government or other stakeholders? That's a, that's a great question. And like our colleagues in uh, in Korea, I think that the first place that we started was focusing on evaluations and responses from the participants on the course themselves, you know, to see did it meet their own needs. But our approach within, uh, within um, the data science campus has been not just focused on the needs of the individual, but focused on the needs of the organization itself. Okay, so if somebody comes to us and they're looking on their own personal training journey, we tend to direct them towards one of our university partners. Partners, so they can get accreditation or degrees or something that helps within their own, own uh, career advancement. We tend to work with different ONS or government departments, and we go in and work with them to assess what they're trying to do with data within their organization and assess their data transformation needs. Um, and so our training programs are tailored to meet the needs of that department. And so we're able to do an impact assessment then to see, well, has that department been able to do what they need to do? I'll give you a concrete example. Our Ministry of Justice approached us. They wanted to roll out um, an, what they called an analytical platform for all of their analysts, maybe 250 analysts across their organization, essentially giving them tools like R um, and R Markdown so they would be able to do a, a reproducible analytical output and move away from working in Excel. Um, we rolled out the champion model where we train up a core group of maybe 30 users and help them scale it out across the whole organization. So so we were able to see what the department wanted to do, how they were trying to use data and big data within their organization. And then we were able to go back at particular stages three months later, six months later, 12 months later, and see have the skills been embedded in the organization? Are the tools widespread? And if not, how do we adapt our training programs to meet the needs of what that department's evolving needs are? So again, what I would say is, is this has led to what we've called um, a maturity matrix tool. And I think Kerry and Dominica are going to talk about this in their presentation coming up, a tool where an organization can essentially assess what they want to do with data science and big data in their organization, where they are today, and help create a roadmap uh, from getting from the here to where they want to be. And we can show where trainings can assist in that journey. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Dave. And there's a uh, one uh, kind of a question because it appears, you know, repeatedly online, uh, and I will address it to all of you. Uh, you know, Kabir Ahmed is asking uh, uh, how to replicate the, the trainings that you are offering, or you're doing, or are you proposing, 
uh, uh, locally uh, in, the, in, the, in the NSOs? Is there any chance for a cooperation, I guess, or uh, maybe just using materials? You have uh, uh, um, related to that already, David, but I would like to ask this question to all of you. I mean, to Christoph, Kim, and you, David, uh, how to how to proceed you know how to replicate these trainings that you're doing uh, is that possible are you are you publishing them uh, and so um, this sort of kind of like a, a you know a question to all of you maybe we will start with christopher well I, I it's a very difficult question but uh, i think there are two ways to answer uh, first we could have self-paced training uh, that helped the learner to really uh, do the training at their own pace and we have to guide them all along the, the course. But of course, this is very uh, difficult to construct because it lacks of interactivity and uh, question and answer. Second thing I think is what David was mentioning, uh, training the trainers would be a good option. Then you can replicate everywhere if you have a bunch of trainers. And, and finally, I think also that uh, maybe it's not feasible from, for a full course, but on specific topics, you could have some micro learning on one topic with all the materials explained in detail using, uh, you know, uh, uh, worksheets and, and, and reproducible uh, that data driven documents where you explain the code and what the code does and the output. So this kind of materials are really self-explaining and self-explanatory, sorry. And so with this variety of uh, approaches, maybe we could have uh, many elements that could be used uh, and reproduced everywhere. But of course it depends on the needs. Uh, if you really need a full curriculum, then you will need probably some supervision on that. Uh, but for specific skills where you can cherry pick what you really want on a specific topic, then this micro learning stuff uh, could be replicated quite easily with downloadable uh, code, source data, and of course, um, video and, and, and materials that uh, people can uh, follow uh, at, their, at their own pace. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph. And uh, now I'd like to address Kim. Kim, uh, what's your reaction to this question? Mm, like if we have any needs from other corporate or other organization what we do usually is that we provide customized programs for each um organizations if we are asked so if there are like certain parts of uh topics that uh certain organization asked we try to customize the training program for the uh, organization Okay, thank you very much. And, and again, to you, David, you already uh, had some remarks on that, but uh, please do uh, continue. Yep. Um, and uh, as I said, you know, all of our material, we're happy to share with everybody. And we have a dedicated team um, that is there to work with other NSOs um, that are, are trying to, uh, you know, scale out the use and application of data science and big data within their own organizations. Um, but but a, a couple of things that I, I would say on this, um, I touched on the UN Global Platform, and there will be another session on this, you know, following on from our session here. This is a fantastic resource here. You know, we will be uploading a lot of our training material and case studies there and I strongly encourage any NSO that is working this in this area to share their material there as well because you know no one organization has a monopoly on best practices far from it you know where where this is a new field for all of us um, and that you know we all have sort of unique applications of particular data sources or methodologies within our environment so we all learn from each other and I think by by sharing these case studies these materials it, as widely as possible you know, it allows us to collaborate and build something jointly together. We're, we're getting huge value from collaborating directly with Statistics Canada on the rollout of a tailored program. And we're seeing things that, that we wouldn't have done before. And, and the, the final thing that I would want to say on this is um, four years ago, we had no data science training program. You know, four years ago, we had no data science campus. There was um, an external review of the Office for National Statistics by uh, uh, and that that said, you know, the ONS 
wasn't capitalizing on new data sources. We weren't providing rapid enough analysis to meet the needs of government and, and other stakeholders. And so the organization made a decision to put a huge amount of investment into building up its data science knowledge. And I think really we've had sort of a rapid trajectory over the course of three to four years to be able to do this. And I think any statistics organization can do this, you know, if it, if it, if it, if it wants to, you know, if it sees the value and the potential. The other thing that I would say is that, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the different big data and data scientists. I would say that while ONS does have dedicated teams of full-time data scientists, that's not what this is about. It's about equipping any statistician, any economist, you know, with the machine learning skills and the coding skills that they need to be able to do their job and, and capitalize and access new forms of data and do analysis faster. They don't have to become a data scientist. And I would think that in fact, four or five years time, we might not actually be using the phrase data science. It will just be, you know, another tool that's in the, the tool belt of statisticians. And I think that's really the direction that we want to see ourselves going with our data science training. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, David. You've said something that uh, just uh, goes so much along with uh, my own uh, view about this. Uh, that it's actually, it is like that. You know, everybody has to be some kind of a data scientist. I would claim that the statistician is just a data scientist uh, and with the new tools, with the new tools maybe, but, uh, but that nothing really changes in the paradigm. But uh, thank you very much for that. And I'll, uh, again, uh, encourage everyone to, to go online and check on the resources of, provided by, by all the three institutions and, uh, and, and uh, it was a very good part of the session, but we have another part of the session as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm quickly uh, going to, to, to the other uh, uh, presentations as well, but this is so interesting. I, I would like to stress the fact that, you know, in, in a business uh, environment, you know, we used to say that, that uh, the R&D is important. You have to devote some part of your income into research and development in order to sustain your organization in the future. And nowadays, this kind of an R&D for NSOs, for National Statistical Offices, is actually investing in big data and all these new methods because this is so quickly developing and this is so important and it is actually uh, will allow us to sustain the our roles in the future and I'd like to encourage everyone to to really start with this and investing in into data science means, uh, means actually you know developing our know, internal training programs and and the things that have been described in, in the past three presentations so thank you all for for presenting uh, uh, you know that this was an exceptional experience uh, also for me you know I'm, I'm working with with you uh, all the times but uh, having a chance to actually see each other and discuss that even briefly is so great that uh, I well um, 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 many thanks to Statistics Korea for organizing that and also for also for of course in the United Nations uh, uh, it's a it's a great experience but now we have uh, the other two presentations uh, and I would like to start with the first uh, of the two, uh, which is going to be provided by Carrie Reagan, which we already have seen on one of the photos in the Dave's presentation, uh, at, together with Dominica. Please. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for joining us for this talk today. My name is Kerry Regan. I'm Senior Programme Manager at the Data Science Campus at the Office for National Statistics in the UK. And my colleague, Dominika Novak, is Head of Unit Experimental Research at Statistics Poland. Both of us today are going to share with you some of the outputs and activities from the task team on training skills and capacity development. The overview for this session is, first off, we're going to be looking at some of the highlights outcomes from the Institutional Readiness for Big Data in Official Statistics that was undertaken last year. Secondly, we're looking at an NSO maturity matrix that is currently in development. Dominica is going to run through the competency framework that is now in place and also will be sharing with you some of the plans for future training provision that are in development. So let's take a look first at the survey the UN survey that was put out last year to assess NSO readiness for big data in official statistics. We looked at four different areas in the assessment. Uh, questions were placed around strategic data science coordination, 
So we were looking for the plans for any big data analytics that were in place or coming. We were interested in the legal framework for data access and sharing. We were also interested in the IT infrastructure, what the capacity at the NSO is for big data storage and analytics, and also human resources. What are the big data data science posts that are currently in place? What are the skills that are in place? And is there any recruitment currently taking place? We issued this um, assessment to 160 NSOs, a response rate of 63%. Thank you to everyone who responded. So if I can just run through some of the high level outputs that came from the assessment and highlight some of the main challenges that are faced by many NSOs. But on the whole, the picture was positive. Uh, many NSOs are engaged with big data projects. So there is a, a positive picture out there. Um, but some of the main challenges for NSOs are around these four areas. So obtaining big data sources outside of government is a challenge for many. Legal frameworks are in place, but however, they may need to be updated for the regulation of big data applications. Data storage around the IT infrastructure, data storage off-site or on-site, um, processing power for many was a challenge and few NSOs at the time of the study were considering secure cloud. Um, on the fourth point, upskilling of analysts, and this is the preferred approach, by the way, um, in terms of recruitment of data scientists directly into the NSO, it, it's, it's a difficult task for many because there is not a huge pot to recruit from. But upskilling of analysts is an option, but most are lacking a competency framework in order to know what skills need to be developed um, to, to, to develop their analysts in that way. So what? What are we going to do now? Well, we're in the process of looking at a big data maturity matrix. This is an NSO level assessment. So looking to produce something that helps the NSO understand its strengths and weaknesses, helps it to identify gaps and possibly develop a roadmap for development. As already mentioned, it came out as a, an area a challenge, um, the lack of a big data competency framework. So our task team has developed one. It is has been launched. Dominica is going to run through what this looks like and how you can access it. And also we're considering what training is required for analysts to upskill them to become data scientists. And again, Dominica will run through the work that is in progress here to think about what training can be put in place. So let me share with you the maturity matrix. This is an NSO level document that will exist. It will be a self-assessment tool for the NSO to determine where it is now and where it wants to be. That should help to inform a plan. The NSO will set its own target. We want to put the power in the hands of the NSO. Not every NSO wants to reach the same level. There will be a set of questions for the NSO to answer. And through answering those, they will be provided with a picture of where it currently is on its big data journey. Any gaps will be identified and should inform an NSO strategic plan. We want to test the maturity matrix before it goes live. We are interested in hearing from NSOs who would like to be part of that test. My email address will be at the end of Dominica's talk. Please get in touch if you'd like to take part. So here's a snapshot of what the maturity matrix will eventually hopefully look like. It's very sparse at the moment. There are four dimensions currently contained within the maturity matrix. You can see those down the left hand side, the legal aspect, IT, human resources and applications of big data. There are four levels identified, currently called pre-foundation, foundation, intermediate and advanced. And I should say these headings may change. We are still in the process of working through the best format for this. 
There will be questions within each level and within each cell for the NSO to answer. And once answered, you will be provided with your current level of maturity in big data at your NSO. You set your own target. In this example, I've put it at the intermediate level and you can then hopefully see some gaps and start planning your way forwards towards your target. That's all I want to say at this stage. I'm going to hand over to Dominica now, who is going to talk through the competency framework and the future training provision. And my email address will be at the end of her talk if you'd like to contact me about the maturity matrix. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will try to give you a short overview of the Big Data Competency Framework, which has been designed as general guidelines on building big data competencies at the NSO. Of course, the term big data competencies might be disputable in the first place, as there doesn't exist a universal set of big data skills. We fully acknowledge that, as well as the fact that there are different types of data specialists, such as data engineer, data analyst, data scientist, and so on. And the skills required in these positions might become even more granular and more specific if referred to different data sources. For instance, it is obvious that processing streaming data entails different skills than processing web script data. The same is true for the skills required at different stages of the statistical production process. Finally, if we look at the NSOs across the UN statistical community, it is apparent that they differ a lot as to big data projects they undertake or big data strategies. So these are just a couple of issues that shape the work on the competency framework. They show how complicated it was to conceptualize and put together the framework in such a way that it is as universal and as useful for a large group of diverse NSOs as possible. Keeping this in mind, it was unavoidable to agree to some simplifications, such as, for example, not going into extreme detail or giving up on addressing each specific data source. So this is just a bit of a background. The competency framework we put out involves two approaches. The first approach structures big data competencies according to general areas of core and generic skills. The second approach matches the identified competency areas to different stages of the simplified statistical production process. Here are the seven areas of the core competencies delineated in the framework. We can refer to them as technical competencies. They are ethics and privacy, mathematics, data management, statistics, programming, machine learning, and data visualization. Now, it is fully acknowledged that these areas are not exclusive, and most of them inextricably intertwine some, if not most, of the other areas. For example, Programming will be part of data management, machine learning, data visualization, and so on. Here you can see the format each competency area was presented in. It includes four dimensions. The first dimension is simply the name of the area. The second one is the description of the key competencies in this area. Next dimension specifies three proficiency levels related to the competencies, that is foundation, intermediate and advanced level. And finally, the fourth dimension breaks down the competency area into the knowledge, skills and attitude, providing their examples. So here, for example, is the description of the competencies um, related to data management. I will, of course, not go into detail the document is available on the UN website, and at the end of the presentation, there will be a um, direct link to it. So now let's move to the second group of the skills in the competency area approach, which are generic skills. They were definitely recognized as intrinsic to the big data competency landscape. 
the framework addresses the soft skills, but it should be stressed that due to their nature and a kind of obviousness, they were not the main focus of the framework and are not as much elaborated in the framework as are the core skills. There were distinguished nine areas of soft skills. Of course, we do not intend to say that this list is exhaustive and we realize there might be quite a lot of alternatives here, but after a few rounds of consultations across the NSOs and the task team member organizations, these areas were agreed to as the key ones. So here we have agile project management, adaptability, business acumen, communication, critical thinking, curiosity, product understanding, storytelling, and team player. Now, stepping from the competency area approach, we attempted to match the competency block, both core and soft ones, with a simplified statistical production process. And here is the outcome of the attempt. What becomes apparent from this graphic representation is that most of the competency areas span various production stages. We believe that this process approach should help discern the complexity and the challenges related to big data competency building across the organization. And um, I would just like to add um, that the competency framework is um, currently going through a six month pilot phase. So uh, I would like to invite you to take a look at it. Uh, the link to it will be displayed in a moment. And any feedback, comments, and suggestions uh, are very welcome. Now, just some final remarks on the future activities the task team on training, competencies, and capacity development is about to undertake in close cooperation with the subject matter task teams of the UN Global Working Group. What awaits us is the development of online training in such domains as Earth observation, AIS, scanner data, and mobile phone data. We are at the initial stage of this endeavor with some of the products expected to be put out at the end of this year. The training will be accessible globally, most probably through the UN Global Platform. We intend to link the competencies outlined in the competency framework to the skills the trainee will acquire through the training. In addition, we are planning to develop a tool which will map the competencies from the competency framework to the training developed by the UN Global Working Group and hopefully other training available on the market. It is intended to help the learners to select the training most relevant and most adequate to their needs. So um, these are our very near future plans. All right, so once again, you're very welcome to contact us for comments, suggestions, and testing of the maturity matrix, as well as the feedback and any suggestions regarding the competency framework. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Carrie and Dominica. It is a very interesting presentation. But now, without any delay, I would like to turn over to Alex and, uh, and Marta and Christina. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting us uh, to be here today. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm with the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I'm joined today uh, by colleagues uh, and friends Christina and Marta from Statistics Poland. Uh, together, we are part of the machine learning project under the UN ECE uh, high-level group on the modernization of official statistics. And we are tasked uh, with, among other things, uh, answering the following questions. Is machine learning useful for official statistics? Uh, and if so, how should we do it? If you don't know the answer to the first question, uh, the answer is yes, machine learning is very useful for official statistics. 
And as part of this project, we have documented a number uh, of examples of this, uh, but let me give you just uh, one. Each year, the Bureau of Labor Statistics collects hundreds of thousands of written descriptions of work-related injury and illness, uh, which we then read through and code to indicate things like the occupation of the worker and the characteristics of the injury or the illness. Um, we, seven years ago, we did this coding entirely by hand um, in a very time consuming process that took about 12 uh, person years of labor to perform each year. Uh, this past year, we did uh, more than 85% of this uh, automatically using machine learning. Uh, so machine learning not only allows us to automate this work, uh, but it turns out the machine learning also performs this work more accurately than our trained human staff. And machine learning is useful not just for these coding and classification tasks, uh, but we're now also using machine learning uh, for record matching and automatic error detection. Uh, there is a catch, however, uh, if machine learning is so useful for official statistics, uh, where is it? Uh, and the reality is that if you look at uh, most statistical agencies, even statistical agencies which are already using machine learning to some degree, um, there is a lot more uh, talk about machine learning and there is actual production use of machine learning. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is that there is a severe uh, lack of, of skills and, and knowledge um, and needed to implement these systems into production processes. Uh, so a big part of what uh, we're doing with this group is trying to address uh, this skills gap. Um, we're doing this in a number of ways. Uh, we've launched a number of pilot projects in different areas of machine learning, uh, including text classification, editing and imputation, and analyzing imagery. Uh, we are conducting research on the uh, evaluation uh, uh, and quality metrics for using machine learning in official statistics. Uh, and we're also engaging in a number of information sharing activities, including conferences and, conferences and workshops uh, and tutorials. Uh, so you will have to wait probably until later this fall for uh, full reports on all of these activities. Um, but until then, um, we have a sneak peek, uh, a sneak preview of some of the work that's being done uh, by our friends at Statistics Poland. Um, and I will now turn it over uh, to Christina and Marta to share that work. I, I think you have to unmute yourself unless uh, I'm doing something wrong with my... Okay, so um, thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning. My name is Krystyna Piątkowska and I'm working in the data engineering department in the statistical office in Poznań. And in this project, I am working on the COICO classification. Uh, I wanted to say a few words about the process of our self-training in the UNIS project and the ideas that we developed that we observed during this project. At the beginning, we had only basic knowledge about machine learning. We knew that this is the situation that a computer algorithm learn how to solve problems. We also knew some algorithm, but we had no experience with machine learning classification. And that was when we saw the script shot by Alex, and it was our first inspiration. We could find there the basic few steps how to start with machine learning classification. Then we learned a lot from the internet, from tutorials, courses, and documentations. But we also found that people from many organizations meet the same problems when they start with text classification. We could observe the first steps of the team from Serbia or IMF, and we could notice that the first step can be the most difficult one. 
we found that every team working on classification problem could be inspired by the same few lines of code. And that was the inspiration to prepare the very basic tutorial on Colab. Uh, only a few steps, the very small data set, 60 sentences in three different languages, and everybody can only click some buttons to classify those sentences. It was tested by the people without any experience with programming, and they said that this is very easy. In the tutorial, there is only one method and default hyperparameters, but it is a good first step into machine learning algorithm. And then, now I'm going to show quickly the tool. In the first step, you have to import uh, all the Python libraries that you need in your classification, and then read uh, the Excel file to the data frame. In the next step, you have to divide your data set into train and test group and vectorize it. And in the next step, you have to choose the classifier. In this case, this is logistic regression, and we train it with our X and Y train data. Now we are ready to test our classifier with the X test data, and we can save all the results in one data frame to see the sentence, the correct category, predicted category, and the probability of the prediction. We can also see the classification report with precision, recall, a point score, and accuracy. In this case, accuracy is 61%. It is quite low, by, but the uh, data set was very small, only 60 sentences, and the test group here in the supported section, it's 18, only 18 sentences. You can also track it on your own sentence. Uh, then you have to, uh, the written sentence uh, change in the vectorized list, and you can use your uh, classifier to predict uh, the outcome. And we have the written, you have written the sentence, good morning, this is the sentence to test the machine learning algorithm. And we predict that this sentence is in English with the probability 94%. And that's all about the uh, tutorial. We have shared also four machine learning methods with hyperparameter tuning and more detailed analysis on the GitHub of Statistics Poland. It can provide some help for people that want to take the next steps in machine learning. Uh, we have invented also some other tool to convince people to use machine learning, and my friend Marta is going to describe it. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, thank you, Krishna, for the introduction. Um, my name is Marta Kruczek Shepard, and I'm working with Kristina in data engineering department in the, uh, at the statistical office in Poznan. Um, yes, uh, as Christina mentioned, the whole process of gathering um, our results was a mix of self-education and uh, gathering information we found uh, into existence. As soon as we uh, received our first satisfying re results, uh, we thought um, what if there was a tool to um, automate our classification. We knew that somewhere in Poland or even in Europe, uh, there were teams uh, in official statistics who were dealing with this kind of job on a daily basis in a manual way. Uh, and this was the moment when we uh, thought that um, it's a good occasion to, to invent a tool that can help uh, our colleagues. <clears throat> and uh, that can be uh, implemented pretty fast um, and uh, really uh, easy to to uh, to serve and now i'd like to uh, present you i'm oh, sorry um excuse me i'd like to present to you this very briefly so this is the main layout of this application um the current version of the application has got uh, several functionalities like uh, choosing the way of classification. It means that we can download the product name list from the file, or we can just simply uh, classify our product name just by entering the name into this placeholder. Uh, the other um, functionality of this application is choosing the classification method. We used four methods in our uh, project, and user can pick one from them, for example, random forest, naive bias, etc. And um, in the output, 
we receive a result table uh, with the information about category prediction for each product we entered, equicup codes and the level of probability. Uh, the other very uh, important uh, feature of this uh, result table is the possibility to edit our records. Uh, so if autocoded category isn't uh, the proper one, we can change it into another one and save it. And if the user consider um, that any table row is unnecessary, we can just delete it. And the best and practical uh, aspect of this application is the fact that we can uh, save our results into XLS or CSV file. So in fact, we can share our results in a pretty fast way with anyone who is working on the same project or leave just our results for our future comparisons. Uh, we think that uh, this tool is uh, it's uh, nice and very um, and very easy to use. And uh, the best thing in this is the fact that uh, all the machine learning techniques, all the mathematics are hidden uh, behind a very friendly interface. So actually, anyone with no programming experience can make use of it. And uh, just uh, no coding uh, abilities are required. So it's really uh, easy to learn and to um, understand it. Yes, so summarizing, uh, all the tools we told you about and realization of such projects like Unisi Machine Learning Project uh, are very important measures to encourage people and institutions um, to experiment with new technologies and show that using machine learning methods can be quite simple. This is a very first and relevant step into developing modern solutions in official statistics. Uh, people are more open uh, to new methods um, if they know at least the base, if they have at least the basic knowledge about. Uh, they know that uh, there is nothing to be scared of. And one more thing we would like to uh, highlight is um, the fact that uh, here in Unicy Machine Learning Project, we found also an inspiration uh, for uh, sharing our knowledge uh, with other uh, project members. Uh, the project leader managed to establish a web page where any member can get familiar with uh, the scripts and reports prepared by other project members. And uh, we did the same. Uh, we published our code on GitHub page and we prepared a detailed report on our work. Um, yes, so coming to conclusion, we uh, think that, yes, alternately training and sharing are a very uh, core keys of success. Yes, so thank you for yeah. your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks to all of you. And uh, it was a pretty interesting uh, presentation. As we've seen, uh, actually, you know, from both presentations, first, we were trying to do a lot of work in, in terms of progressing the collective, you know, uh, 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 work on the on on things uh, that are uh, that constitute the, the fundamentals, like uh, uh, competency frameworks and, and, and stuff. And then we have some uh, examples of international cooperation uh, in terms of using these matters actually in something very concrete. And I think that gives us a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, insight into uh, what can be done. And uh, uh, thank you all for, for, for presenting. I, I think we are in a little bit of uh, time stress. So online, I would like to, uh, extend the, the time the time of the session too much there's been an uh, an avalanche of uh, of questions and, and remarks on the chat which i'll uh, not actually uh, read out here in the presentation i encourage all of you to to see them uh, there's been some congratulations as well some uh, some questions for for example our, our dear friend Mark has asked about the competency framework. Why well, are we using survey and not just like any other modern techniques? But the, the, the issue is that we are using your survey to, to just to address the issues of uh, awareness and, uh, and see the, the 
capacity in the in the offices. Our competency framework is a separate thing that has been you know developed uh, uh, throughout the the set of meetings uh, in order to come up with something that will constitute a material that is, uh, you know, feasible to be reused in all the NSOs across the world. And uh, so that the, these two processes were separate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, especially David, for sharing all the links to uh, interesting materials uh, for um, for our audience. And, uh, uh, and uh, Mark again asked for uh, the opportunities for the private sector to support the training competency building. I think that uh, actually it's my personal opinion. Uh, I haven't uh, kind of like discussed it with anyone, but I guess that the space of innovation, you know, the possible uh, space for innovation here is, uh, is, is, is unlimited. And uh, everyone who is, in, uh, who, who is interested is, is, is very much invited and, and, uh, you know that actually we lack the resources rather than have too much of them. So, so also the private sector is very, very well welcomed, and, uh, and that would be great to have some, uh, some contributions. We had some initial cooperations with the private sector. COVID nineteen has changed it for for different reasons, but uh, this is not something that has been uh, closed. It's still open, and uh, uh, we are waiting for all the. Uh, possible contributions from all around the world and all different, uh, you know, contributors. And uh, uh, thank you very much for for the compliments for the session. Uh, there's one question, very concrete. Do we have any timelines uh, or, uh, in, you know, time frames uh, 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 that are available for our audience in order to to make them aware of what is going to come up when and. I know the answer to it, but maybe I'll address it to Dominica and Carrie or Carrie and Dominica. Do we have some kind of a time frames? Yeah, uh, as far as the competency framework, we're going through a six month pilot phase right now. So we really uh, we will really welcome any comments, any suggestions, any any tips on how to further uh, develop if it develop it if, if it's necessary. So, so that's basically as far as the competency framework. Um, the other um, deliverables that we're work working on that Kerry was, um, I was talking about, which is maturity metrics, we are still developing it. So yeah, we believe by the end of the year, probably it'll be put out. Kerry, could you please? Yeah, thank you, Dominica. We're in the design phase for the maturity matrix uh, within, the, within the working group. Uh, that we've established, we will be pushing out for a test, say in the next three months, and um, we'll be very keen for NSOs to come forward and help us with that testing phase. So th thank you very much. A lot of compliments to, to the session on the chat and uh, uh, I, I will contribute to these compliments. Thank you to all the presenters. You, you did a great job. I'm really privileged to, to be a part of this session. And my role, uh, I, that's, that was awesome. Thank you very, very much. And I hope that all of you enjoyed it very much. And I'm sure that there's a lot of questions and a lot of issues that we can discuss together. So please get in touch together. Just, just yeah, we can cooperate on a daily basis. And, uh, and uh, I'll, I would really like to encourage you to do so. There's so many things that we can still do. and. And they're waiting for 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 the support and our engagement. Uh, that uh, that there are no limits. Thank you very much for the session. And I would like to quickly announce uh, uh, what I was what I've been asked for. Uh, that there's going to be a 10 minutes uh, technical break before the next session starts. So that that that's a little technical announcement. Thank you very much again. It was a pleasure to be part of that.